Hi everybody, welcome back to Too Cool for Middle School. It is the end of June and I have my June wrap up for you. But before we talk about all the books that I read in June, I also have a giveaway for you. So my book, Leaders and Thinkers in American History, is officially out. I will leave the link down below if you wanna pick one up for yourself, but I'm also going to be giving away three signed copies at the end of this video. So just stick around till the end and I'll tell you how to enter. And I feel like your odds are pretty good. You know, I'll, I'll pick three different winners. So makes it a little bit more likely for you to win. So I'm just gonna set this aside for a second. And we're gonna talk about reading in June. So I think this was my lowest reading month of 2021 which is kind of weird because I've been on summer break for most of it. So I have had time, it's just, I don't know. I was having trouble concentrating this month and I bounced around a lot between books. So I have quite a few that I'm really enjoying. I don't know why I haven't finished them, but they're, you know, sitting on my nightstand, like half read. So, you know, I'll jump over to those again soon. But this video might be a little bit shorter because I didn't really read that much. I read seven. The first book that I finished in June was my favorite. I really, really loved The Night Watchman by Louise Erdrich, but this one took me a long time to finish as well. I started it several months ago. I remember it was at our old apartment, so it's been quite a while since I started it, but it was just one of those that I sat down at some point and it took me kind of a while to get back into it. There are a lot of characters in this book, so I think for some people it might take a little while to get into, but I think that's like kind of the point um, is that like in this community, everybody is a part of the story. Everybody is integral to the survival of everybody else. And so sometimes you're kind of trying to figure out like who the main character, I mean, there is a main character. Well, there are two. So um, Pixie or Patrice is one of the main characters and she works at this jewel bearing plant that's on the reservation where she lives. And she really provides for her family for the most part. Um, her father is an alcoholic and he's very violent and they are always just hoping that he doesn't come around. Her mother is one of the most interesting characters. She just has all of this tribal knowledge about healing and dreams and I really love how that was like interwoven into the story. And then she has a sister who has gone into the city. I think it's Minneapolis. They live in like the Midwest, like Wisconsin, Minnesota area. It's very cold where they are. And this takes place in like the 1950s. Um, so this covers this time when uh, the government was kind of trying to push indigenous people off of their own lands and into the cities. And so anyway, um, Patrice's sister goes into the city, but then they lose track of her and they're not sure where she is. And Patrice and her mother both have dreams about her and they have dreamed that she has a baby. And so they really want to find her because they, they, they can tell that she's in danger and that her baby is also in danger. So that's kind of like one thread of the plot. And then there's also a man who is like a family friend of theirs named Thomas, and he is a security guard at that same plant. And he is part of the tribal leadership and he's very smart and he recognizes in like a letter that he receives from the US government that they want to try to like dissolve the tribal rights to the land and the way that it's said in this government document like it kind of seems like it's going to be a good deal for the tribe but he recognizes that it isn't and the only way to really fight back against this is to actually go to washington dc and speak up on behalf of his tribe and he also recognizes that this would be good for a lot of the neighboring tribes as well if he can like establish this legal precedent the really interesting part about that is that thomas's story is based on the real life story of louise erdrich's grandfather and he actually did this and she found uh, like the government documents and the records of his battle with the US government. So it's really, really interesting. Um, there are some side characters that are like boxers and Mormon missionaries and 
it's just such a well-told story and you just grow to love the character so much. Oh, there's this other character who is the daughter of one of the men on the reservation, I think, and then maybe her mom is white, so I think she kind of grows up off the reservation and she ends up going to college and she comes in to help them do some research and her character is just like really, really funny. She was one of my favorites, so I highly recommend this book and if you feel like you're getting like a little bit lost in the characters and the community and stuff at the beginning, just keep going because it, it all comes together and even if you can't really follow every single character, it's okay. Like they're, it, it's just because they're all kind of one, you know? The next book that I read this month was The Barren Grounds by David A. Robertson. And I think it must have been at the beginning of this month when we started to hear the news about all of these mass graves of children. Hmm. Um, that they have been finding, I, I think in US residential schools too, but um, mostly like Canadian residential schools where indigenous children were sent. They also discussed that in The Night Watchmen. Um, yeah, but... I just, I didn't know what to do with that sadness. And so I just wanted to read stories of indigenous people by indigenous authors. And I don't, I don't know that it helped, but you know, that was just, that was what I could do. So um, this one is, is interesting because it also takes place in Canada. This is a middle grades fantasy. And so I will be using this next year with my seventh graders in our fantasy unit. With my eighth graders, I used Elatsue and they were able to like grasp it. Elatsue is kind of like a, it's a little bit more of like a horror story and it's kind of like a Jordan Peele get out style horror story. So I'm thinking for most seventh graders, it might be like a little bit advanced. So um, I was gonna switch that out for this one with my seventh graders. And I've heard this one described as an indigenous Chronicles of Narnia. And I think that does kind of work. There are these two siblings. Um, they have, they're just foster children in the same family. And there's a pretty deep exploration of, um, you know, like foster children who are indigenous being fostered by these white people who are well-meaning and trying to help them retain their culture. But like, can you even really do that? So that was like an interesting thread in the book but they do find kind of like a secret portal and they go into this other world that's very snowy and wintry and there are talking animals and they need to help them find kind of the key to bringing back like springtime and food and, and all of that. So it is kind of similar to the Chronicles of Narnia. So if you have students that like those stories, recommend this series to them as well. This says book one and I haven't seen book two come out yet. I'm not quite sure if it has, but this does, it, it does wrap things up in the end, but it also leaves some questions unanswered and some room for the story to continue. So I definitely want to get my hands on book two when I can. The third book that I finished in July, it's kind of embarrassing. Um, this one is called Elijah, Faith and Fire by Priscilla Schurer. I always want to say Schreier, but I think it's Schurer. Um, I started this in February <laughs> and I didn't finish it until July. And the really bad thing is that I was leading a Bible study of this, um, just like on Zoom, like I just announced it on Instagram. I was like, if anybody else happens to be doing this Bible study, like let's talk about it together on Saturday mornings on Zoom. 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 Um, and that was awesome. I really, really enjoyed that. I loved getting to know some people who I didn't know all that well before um, that, you know, kind of like part of the YouTube, Instagram community and stuff. And um, we just met on Saturday mornings for a couple of weeks and talked through what we were reading and learning. And that was awesome. Um, and then it, it ended and I did, like, didn't keep reading. <laughs> I think I packed this and then we moved and then it took me a while to pull it out again, but it is really good. I love learning about prophets <laughs> and like people in the Bible who are very outspoken and very bold and, you know, don't always seem like they're doing the smartest thing, but they're doing what they were called to do. So um, yeah, I thought this was a really good study. As I was doing this study, I've also been learning a lot more about like the actual facts of the situation in Israel and Palestine that has been going on for what 70 years um, so it's it's just interesting that like 
a map is such a big part of this book and like it takes place you know in Gaza and so we do have so much like literature because of the Bible and stuff about this place and so it, it was just strange just reading about the same location thousands and thousands of years ago where so much conflict is still going on today and I feel like we tend to forget that there are so many Palestinian Christians and that Christianity really, you know, originated in this area too. It's just, I have more to say about it. I have said more about it. Um, and I'm reading another book about Palestine right now that I'll probably share um, next month. So yeah, I, I, I recommend this. It was like, I, I feel like I was challenged in so many good ways by uh, so many of the lessons. And then also like there was a little bit of that rhetoric about like, the promised land and Israel and the Jordan River and stuff and I just like I'm I'm uh, grappling with that a little bit right now. The next book that I read was Somebody's Daughter, a memoir by Ashley C. Ford and this was recommended by John Green. Um, she was on his channel for a little while um, just talking about her new book and it sounded really interesting and so I just wanted to, to pick it up and read it. This is you know a fairly short one so this is one that you could get through kind of quickly, except that there's so much trauma and abuse in it. So she just writes about her life growing up. Um, she grew up mostly with her mom who worked really hard, but you know, was like of that generation where really beating your kids was acceptable and sort of funny, I get. Like that's like how she describes it. And um, it was hard on Ashley. And then her father was in prison for most of her life. I knew what for before I read this from an interview with Terry Gross and I feel like it would actually be better not to know. So I won't tell you what he was in prison for, um, but there's a line somewhere near the end it says he'd committed a horrific crime and he'd paid for it with a significant portion of all our lives. And that even might not be payment enough. And just, you know, this idea that like when a family member goes to prison, it is true that, you know, the rest of the family tends to also pay for that. And so um, from her perspective, that was just a difficult part of growing up. And then she also experiences some sexual abuse. And so uh, I just think most people have experienced some of the things that she has. And so as you're reading, you know, just these very honest accounts from her, sometimes it brings up stuff in your own life as well. So um, that can be healing in some ways, but then like also I would offer kind of a trigger warning for this because there is a lot of like physical and sexual abuse that is mentioned in this book. So it can also be a little bit hard to get through. The next book that I read was Say Nothing, A True Story of Murder and Memory in Northern Ireland by Patrick Radden Keith. And I definitely read this because of Dairy Girls. If you haven't seen Dairy Girls on Netflix, it's D-E-R-R-Y. There's like a city in Northern Ireland called Dairy. I highly recommend it. I think it's so much fun. It's so interesting to learn about that part of history through like this sitcom and a bunch of like funny teenage girls. Um, the show is so, so good. And I did want to understand more of the history behind the IRA and the conflict between like Ireland and Northern Ireland. Well, really more like Britain and Northern Ireland. And honestly, actually, as I was reading this one, I was seeing a lot of parallels with Israel and Palestine. And they actually make that connection. He makes that connection sometimes in the book as well, um, because some members of the IRA really uh, admired like some of the resistance fighters from Palestine and from like Latin American countries. So, gosh, I guess this takes place mostly during the 70s, kind of 70s, 80s, a little bit in the 90s. Um, and so, like, put in that context, like a, a global context, that was very interesting to see, you know, quite a few of these, like, revolutions taking place around the world at the same time. And then the ways that, like, the counter resistance worked in, like, really violent ways. Um, like as a history book, this wasn't great. And then as like a journalistic piece, it's just very, very long. Like he definitely needed to edit some of this out. But a couple of the really interesting things that stuck with me were like this guy who, you know, he was part of the British army and he worked in, I want to say like Nigeria and he ugh, like practiced these like counter 
revolutionary like suppression tactics there and then of course you know the British were practicing that in India and just all over the world like it just reminds you like how awful Britain was ugh, and just how far spread and widespread the violence was as they're not only colonizing places but then you know putting down any attempts at resistance or trying to put down those attempts so then even in Northern Ireland where okay so I guess the way I understand it is the majority of Ireland is Catholic and Irish but then in Northern Ireland, it's actually majority like Protestant and British. So they did not vote to like become their own thing, like to become Ireland. But then there was this, you know, smaller population of Irish Catholic people who were like, no, we do want to become part of Ireland or like not to be under the subjugation of England because, you know, they weren't able to like get certain jobs and they weren't treated equally by the British. And it's very segregated there because like Catholic kids went to Catholic school and Protestant kids went to Protestant school and Catholic people lived in their own neighborhoods and Protestant people lived in their own neighborhoods. So a really, you know, weird situation. I didn't realize how oppressive Britain was to Ireland. I guess I need to watch more of, um, what's that show? I started watching it. I watched like a season Outlander, right? Like I think that kind of started to show us a little bit more of like the centuries old violence of Britain and subjugating these other peoples. But I didn't really realize that during like the potato famine, like Irish people were producing food and they had to like send it all over to Britain. So they're like starving to death in their own land. And then so many people came to America. So I guess there are like more Irish people in Boston and <laughs> like Massachusetts than in Northern Ireland, I think. So uh, like the history is a little bit like few and far between in this book. It's mostly interviews of people who were in the IRA. And there's like a little bit of this thread, less, less than I thought there would be from the beginning, but of like this lady who was kidnapped, who had like 10 kids and they like never heard from her again. And trying to solve that mystery. And then the end is about how like all this stuff went down like during this war. And then it was just kind of over, like there were peace talks and nothing was ever really resolved. Like there were plenty of people's bodies who had never been found and like all these crimes that had been committed, but people were just kind of like, not gonna say anything about it. So honestly, I would like to read more about this topic. This book didn't give me enough. It wasn't enough history in this. So I don't know that I would really recommend it, but if you know of any like documentaries or other books about Northern Ireland, let me know. The next book that I read was part of Amory's book club for the month of June. And do yourself a favor, go to her Instagram. It's just the regular Amory Instagram and watch her. It, it's a saved Instagram live. So it's on her like IGTV now with the author. And it was so good. It went longer than like some of them tend to do. And we talked so much about history. And so the author is is a professor. He kept talking about like his history classes and stuff. So he really, really knows his stuff. I didn't realize that he had more novellas than this. And I think he just came out with his own novel as well. So he's written a lot. Um, this one is called Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark. And so just to give you like the basics, this book is set in reality, but there's also elements of fantasy and horror as well, which just make like perfect sense. So this takes place like just after the turn of the 20th century. That's when the KKK emerges. Well, they emerge right after the Civil War and they were pretending to be ghosts of Confederate soldiers and they would like ride around and terrorize black people. Um, it was started in Tennessee the year after the Confederacy fell. And then there's like a resurgence. Ah, if you read, you know, um, my chapter on Ulysses S. Grant in this book, you'll learn a little bit more about it. Um, I can't remember how much they like edited out of that chapter about the KKK. There's still some in there. Um, but Grant was able to pass some federal laws that did like shut down some of the terrorism of the KKK. But then there's a resurgence, like in the 19 teens, 1920s. There's a really good book about this. 
I can't remember where I put it, but um, by Linda Gordon. And it's about like the second rise of the KKK. Anyway, in this book, the Klan is like the human KKK, and then Ku Kluxes are monsters. So people in the Klan can like turn into these Ku Klux monsters, basically if they have like enough hate in them. And there's going to be a showing of this movie called The Birth of a Nation and the resistance to these monsters. They're thinking like, oh, that movie is probably enough to turn a lot of these clan members into Ku Kluxes and like create even more monsters. So they're not <laughs> real excited about the showing of this movie. Um, so then the main characters are these three black women who fight Ku Kluxes and they're each very unique. I feel like they each kind of represent a different type of not only woman, but like a different type of um, ideal for black people at that time and like what they wanted moving forward. And Maurice is kind of like the main one and she has this sword. It's interesting because it's like an ancient sword that was also used to capture slaves in Africa and it's been like passed down to her. Um, and then she has like these visions where she'll like get advice from these kind of ghost auntie people. <laughs> so it's really, really interesting. I feel like I read it too fast. I read it in a couple of days. It's one that you should go back and read like multiple times. This would be perfect for a college English class because there's so much metaphor. Every single line is just like packed full of meaning and there's so much history in it. There are so many references. There are so many ideas. Like this book is definitely a masterpiece and so if you happen to be a professor, I would definitely recommend, oh gosh, it would be just so much fun, I think, to read this in a college English class and like have that time to just like sit around and talk about it and dissect it. I just think that would be amazing. So I do really recommend this one, but I also recommend being able to debrief with somebody else. And if you don't have anyone else to debrief with, watch the IGTV on Amory's Instagram. The book that I just finished is Luck of the Titanic by Stacey Lee, and I have read all of Stacey Lee's books. I really like what she does. She does historical fiction, and it's like American historical fiction, and she always does it from the perspective of a Chinese girl. And so there were Chinese people in all of these instances that she writes about, but for the most part, like, we don't know their stories. So she'll find like a little snippet somewhere in an archive or something and that'll be like her inspiration for her story and then you know of course it's historical fiction so she'll just kind of make up the rest of it and these are intended for young adult audiences. So apparently there were eight Chinese men on the Titanic and six of them survived. I think that's what it says in the author's notes. So she just kind of like took that and was like, all right, I'm gonna write about the Titanic then and include a young girl. She's like 17. Um, I've been watching, I've been re-watching Downton Abbey lately. So it was kind of fun to have like all the Downton Abbey like um, outfits and accents and everything in my mind as I was reading this because um, these characters are from England and then they are sailing over to New York, which, you know, there's some trouble along the way. Um, and then actually, like, most of them are headed ultimately to Cuba. The Chinese Exclusion Act plays pretty prominently in this book because one of the characters wants to go to America and they're like, you can't, there's this whole Exclusion Act thing and Americans will not let you in, so. So it's really interesting. Um, I'm always just, like, slightly annoyed by <laughs> Stacey Lee books because in my opinion, I feel like she should write in third person because she's having to write in first person, but like with the kind of mannerisms and speech patterns of how people would talk back then, but it's never like fully consistent. I feel like this was more consistent than some of her other books, but I feel like the answer to that is just to write in third person and then you don't have to keep it up for 375 pages. <laughs> but I have a feeling that like young adult readers prefer first person. I don't know. I have a feeling like that decision is based in like market research. In this book in particular, she uses the term pins, which means like legs, you know, like pins, gams, stems, whatever, you know, those are all like slang for legs. But 
it's like constant. It's on like every other page. And it always seems like she's using it for feet. I'm like, wait, are you using this historical slang correctly? <laughs> like if I were a student, if I were like an eighth or ninth grader and I didn't know what the heck pins meant, I would just be very confused. I don't know. I'm just always like 5% annoyed every time I read <laughs> Stacey Lee books, but it's because I'm an adult and I'm like, you know, trying to read a YA book through an adult lens. And then I'm 95% like very entertained and impressed with how much history she infuses into these books. So I definitely recommend it just more so for students than adults. But this one was, was really, really cool and different. The ending is a shocker too. I was like, what? I, I didn't, uh, I didn't predict it. Even though like anything, you know, that takes place on the Titanic, there's always that like looming iceberg that's coming, but then there's like a epilogue ending. So now let's get into the giveaway. I'm going to choose three winners. So all you have to do in order to enter to win is just like this video and then leave a comment saying who you would like to read this book with. So I know many of you are teachers, so maybe you wanna read it with your fifth grade class or fourth grade class or whatever, um, but you do not have to be a teacher to enter. Maybe you wanna read it with your kids or your nieces, or maybe you just wanna read it by yourself to just like brush up on US history. Honestly, as I was researching this book, I read a lot of history books that were geared more towards students, like this one is, and I love doing that. It was really, really interesting. Like there are so many good ones out right now and it's great to, you know, just kind of be able to read something quickly and just like gain a bunch of new knowledge as an adult in a pretty short amount of time. So maybe you just want to read it by yourself and that's fine as well. But if there is anyone you want to read it with, I want to be sure to include that when I sign this for you. So that's why I'm asking for that as well. So you'll just leave a comment. I will reply to these comments by Saturday. Let me check the date on that. Let's see, Saturday is going to be July 10th. So on July 10th, check your YouTube notifications to see if I replied to your comment saying that you are the winner. And the winners will need to email me with your shipping information so that I can sign this for you, mail it out to you. This tends to happen with giveaways that like one or more of the people like won't respond and I can't get a hold of them. And so then I have to just skip them and choose a new person. So I will need you to respond within 24 hours so that I can get your book sent out or choose another person in case you don't happen to check back. So be be checking back. <laughs> I'll put up a reminder on like 